Okay, hello everybody. I'm Lauri Patero talking about operational, operational technology and in particular device security there. And uh, there are lots of uh, uh, standards in the area, so they create sometimes quite a moment to remember the numbers. My content is first I introduce operational technology, so if you know it, you are, get very, you are going to get very bored. Sorry. Then I'm a little bit talking about the standard itself. It's a big thing. I'm not going to go at, to any depth in the standard itself. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit, bit about the device part of the standard and uh, process part. And finally, we end up with missing parts because the standards really don't cover everything there is in security. My background is I started with smart cards, so I have started all my life I have been doing security in a way or another, doing hardware, software, and uh, processes, even some business development. And lately I have been doing industrial device security in Vapais. So, I didn't actually make any pictures about industrial devices, because they are grey boxes and they are put into grey cabinets. If you want to see them go downstairs, there is a corner department, there are some of, corner stand, there is some of them, and if you really want to see something, go to Wärtsilä, solve the, the stand and solve the, capture the flag and see even more of them. I don't think, I don't want to show you 10 different grey boxes doing different things. I wouldn't make the difference. Only colorful thing is the manufacturer logo, even if that, if that is even colorful one. What is important in operational technology? Typically, it's availability. You have to work. If you stop working, people are either highly annoyed, like in elevator, or then you lose a lot of money, like in factory, because factories, if they stop working, they are fixing some things of money. And even more, lots of people will get annoyed when you don't have electricity. Of course, electricity may have some other problems, like in Ukraine they are having. But uh, during peaceful times, industrial automation is the most risky thing in the in the electronics, in the in the electric grid. And electric grid is really handling big amounts of energy. It's easy to forget. There are even one wind mile is 10 megawatt compared to home electronics. Home electronics doesn't con consume anything. So if something starts to go wrong, it may go wrong the big way. And even worse it can go if you are having a, let's say, big container ship. It has 10 times, four magnitudes of more energy in its motion compared to car in highway. So when it hits some, some solid object, there is really a mess and maybe environmental problems. If it's oil, you are going to have big problems. And in mining side, if things go wrong, you will get people killed easily. And going to extremes, some kind of oil refinery, there is a hot stuff there. I know very little about those, but there are some hot stuff. And if you don't shut it down correctly, it will make a lot of problems. There is, uh, in oil refinery contains about the energy of atomic bomb at the refinery site. Of course, it doesn't explode as quickly as atomic bomb, but still when it's burning, it's better to go the other way. It's not going to, you are not going to go closer to it. That is what operates, it, all these are operational technology things, so they basically follow the same pattern. And I'm going to present it from network point of view, just to give you the idea what are the real problems in operational technology. At the lowest level, you have actual things that are doing something or moving something, motors, uh, conveyor belt, uh, pumps, and things that are measuring. The connections are typically analog or serial port or proprietary. There is all kind of weird stuff going there. It's not really. Uh, standardized or anything. Van vendors do very different things. And of course, there it's enough to have a physical access to be able to do evil things. 
you can't really attack those connections remotely because they don't rotate anyway, or you just have to go into place to do some evil things. Hammer is pretty good there. Of course, you could leave some nice things there also doing later something active, but that's a different thing. Then there is some field network. It's typically real time, software hard. So it's controlling that things are going right. If it's not controlling, then things are not going right. And uh, it doesn't really do anything like TLS today. It, it's, it is highly unsecure if you can connect to it. Usually, it's only beginning to get TLS-like things. Then there is a plant network. This is now looking already a bit more like Ethernet. It's not typically Ethernet and connecting whole stuff together. Firewalls in between, they are typically application firewalls. They could be also normal firewalls, but often they really inspect what is going through. And of course, as Tuknek told us, good way to attack this kind of system is USB when you don't have any connections outside. I mean, you have to somehow bring in your malware. Also, you can have supply chain attacks, so you change the devices going into the facility. I don't know how much this really today happened, but at least in uh, electric grid, they are considerable risk, I think. And then, of course, today, vendors are bringing their laptops, their phones, in order to serve the thing. You have some problem there, so vendor wants to debug it, so they're bringing their laptop, they connect, they need something from their corporate network, so they connect it through their phones to that, and suddenly this whole thing is in the internet, even in the worst case. I mean, it, almost anything can happen at that point. Then, IT network, Every, every, I think almost every uh, operational network is nowadays connected to some bigger network with, through a gateway. And then the bigger network is, of course, go, go into cloud or internet. And of course, there are ransomware that they are running in the IT network. So the only question is when these guys making ransomware will go to the operational side and start to stress that also because it might be good business. I don't know if it's good business for ransomware, because if a ransomware would attack the plant network and field network, I don't think most factories would recover by getting the keys from the ransomware vendor. They would buy new devices. The devices are so cheap compared to the rest of the stuff they are running. So they probably throw out all the stuff and buy a new one. Of course, they might have trouble getting those stuff. So then it's a different story. Then, for a reason or another, many of these systems actually connect through VPN to some place. It might be vendor that is offering them some automation or collecting some data, or then it might be a second uh, plant where they where they uh, have where they want to coordinate things. And well. We have already seen attacks coming through these VPNs. VPN is own tunnel, so it doesn't itself protect that much. You can go through it and attack. And then final and most recent funny thing is these IoT devices that are sometimes bypassing all of these nice layers that try to offer security. Uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, connection is really confusing to think about in this model. So, we have plenty of standards. Uh, this is only random set. I did look at the actual product, but then I realized that if I put the actual product list here, you, will, you can work out what product it is. So I didn't want to do that. Standard, there is standard for almost everything. There is even standard for markings in the device, that what kind of marking symbols should you use there. And, of, and for example, there is security standard for grid there that tells how TCP, uh, how TLS should be used in that context, what kind of things and all kind of details. Pretty much everything is standardized. By standards, for example, electric magnetic interface, you want to have this kind of basic hygiene, just not to have anything too awful there. You may have safety. So you want to know that safety is properly reliable, 
then it's not about liability. When you can say that I follow this standard, I'm not liable. And the guy who buys your device can also say that this was made according to standard, so we made good care of it. it. We are not liable either. And then there is this funny places like explosive environments where you can have sparks, which where you actually want to be pretty sure that it's not going to have any sparks. So this ATX114 is, I think, that kind of thing. There are different levels of mandatory. And it's not very clear yet what the role of these kind of security standards will have here. For example, maritime insurance costs will go up if you don't certify. So there they will definitely use certified devices. In critical infrastructure, there is also it's coming that you need to certify the device. It's very likely that you need to certify the devices that make electric work. But other than that, I don't know what will happen. Customers might buy the certified devices because they must be more be better than the non-certified, but they don't, then they actually don't certify the plant at all, which makes it pretty much useless. But I don't know, that time will show. So what kind of thing is this um, standard itself? <sighs> okay. Not working, okay. We have there, uh, in the asset owner is the guy who owns the stuff. They set policies how the thing should behave, how it, what kind of things are done and how, it, how are they done then. And they seldom know what they are buying, what they are running. They want to get system integrators who can pull together the stuff, otherwise it doesn't really make sense to them. It doesn't work. And these system integrators have already uh, kind of making all these configurations that you need to do to make the thing work. But actual products, they are not, they are mass, mar mass manufactured, so they are not configured yet. And product supplier pro produces this kind of general purpose devices that can be used. They can be applications, embedded devices, network or host, but they are anyway kind of general purpose, they are not made for specifically this case. It might be made for some general use case like wind turbine, but still it's uh, uh, for many kinds of wind turbines in a way. And there are two standards here that are now getting, I would say that companies are competing to implement them right now. First companies have them, certifications for some products, some companies have Pretty, have all, only started the road to certify them. And there, when, it, when creating certified product, you need to also certify your development process. So you must have process that is also validated, that it seems to work. There are multiple certificates, teams, multiple certifiers, so it's, that side is uh, pretty much mess, I would say. There is probably a situation that some certifiers are better than others, and here we go. <clears throat> the standard specifies security levels. What, it, what the device can resist? SL1 is lowest. You can't hack it accidentally. But if you intend to hack it, you are allowed to. It, it doesn't have to resist that anymore. Okay, good. Pretty secure. Then SL2 is it's the most common level I have seen companies certifying devices now, is hackers with simple means and few resources, general skills, low motivation. So everybody here has high motivation, has more, uh, and uh, some industry-specific knowledge probably after this presentation, and they have high motivation. So it can't stop you, sorry, according to standard. Well, tough luck. And these goals are really interesting because they don't really tell what the standard is aiming at. They don't reflect really content of the standard. But still, standard says that these are the levels that are being aimed at. I don't think any, I haven't yet seen SL4 highest level uh, project myself, but I doubt this 
this um, certification model will work very well there. It won't really give guarantees that nation state attacker wouldn't be able to compromise something. No way. And on the other hand, starting point in industrial security is pretty low. Lots of devices are really such that you can accidentally hack them. If you run nmap scan to network, the network will go down. Sorry. So maybe these goals are not so wrong after all. Maybe they are reasonable goals as a first step. And in actual product security, there is also huge variation. Linux devices tend to be reasonably okay. The closer you go to the op real-time operation system that is custom fit by company, the more likely it is that it fails pretty miserably. About the requirements, the actual device security requirements are actually mostly functional requirements. So these are telling what kind of functionality the device implements. So you can verify them by functional testing. Pretty easy to verify that, yes, it is very implementing TLS. It doesn't say how many bugs TLS implementation has. And security level changes what exact functionality you need to implement. But funny thing, this is in the standard, this is pretty much the only thing that changes with the security level. So in SL3, I think you need to implement uh, multi-factor authentication, or was it SL4? Don't exactly remember, but these kind of things pop up more and more there when you write them. And then when you don't can't do something or don't want to do something, for example, you don't want to do secure boot, then you document that you didn't do it and customer needs to protect against it. And that's, I think, really valuable thing because now you should know what vendor has tried to do, what, they, what is the best they even think they could have done. And today, most common challenge is, well, encrypted communication or lack of encryption. It is there or then it's not. It's, it very slow. Then the, the standard at uh, SL2 at least requires per user accounts. But I don't know how sensible it is to have a user, per user accounts on motor control that is controlling some motor. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me, but it, standard requires that. It's a little bit flat in its thinking that everything is similar. Maybe third one is that it requires secure boot pretty much everywhere, but I don't think absolutely every device requires that. The process thing is complex. I mean, I try, try to draw this kind of simple, and it, this is simplified version. This is heavily simplified version of it. There is threat modeling, security requirements. That's okay. Threat modeling is driving security requirements, and then we have verification validation with lots of different kind of tests, and then implementation, managing for third-party components, and secure by design and coding standard stuff. We have plenty of reviews. I would say everything is reviewed and preferably once a year. So there will be, this it cannot be implemented very lightly or then you have to explain away a lot of stuff. So if you are making this kind of device that is secure against accidental misuse, it might make, it doesn't really add up that you have heavy process to make rather insecure device. But when, when going higher security levels, it makes a lot of sense. There is a traceability of requirements. I have heard that this is one of the tricky parts for development teams that they don't, they can't really make this kind of security test traceable to security requirements. Well, yes, I understand it. And uh, in many parts, it's documenting pretty obvious things that are not, not really adding value. But but the main problem is probably that, uh, well, there is the tester independence test that is really good thing to have. You can't put your development team to do pen testing of your, the device. That just doesn't fly. You have to get maybe not some external, but at least different department in your company to do it. But then there is, comes the negative side. I mean, nothing really verifies in the standard or puts any kind of 
quality requirements for these. So as soon as you have threat model, it's pretty much okay. And I can promise to you that the threat models are so complex that no accessor is ever going to read them through. They are, they are way too big. Lots of stuff and lots of this kind of details that, that uh, make really difficult to read. Of course, you can make simple threat model out of it, but then it doesn't really add much value either. Also, requirements and testing is kind of thing that there is not really way to handle them very well. And there is, for example, there is no feedback to developers. Nothing says that you have to tell to developers how did, did they do. Did they implement city code or did they do it correctly? And of course, there is no word culture in whole documentation. Why there should be? Because cultures don't make software, right? And even worse, security level is not impacting the process. So this process is pretty good if you aim at some kind of SL2, SL3. But if you aim at SL1, it's complete overkill. And if you aim at SL4, it's not sufficient, I would say. It's not nearly sufficient. It, it's lacking too much human side. So, it really, one of the good things it standard really does do, it enables organizations to pen, spend money. These companies can't use money to security unless it has standard. That's impossible. I mean, if it's requirement, it has to have standard. That's the way thinking goes. I'm really surprised by that myself because I have been working in completely different environments before, but it's the way it is. And it addresses worst of the current problems. You won't see any more this kind of device that crashes when you do NMAP after this. And it helps users. They will know what they get a little bit better than before. Right now they have no clue what they get. And security levels do not really, really reflect the work needed or this kind of thing. That, that gap is there that it's, it has at least, it has at most two meaning, at most two, two meaningful security levels. The first and last are not really that meaningful in the standard at all. I know Nick, at least Nick has tried to apply this outside industrial sector, car, for evaluating car, but they reported that it's, awfully tired to industrial things. It, wouldn't, it didn't work very well. Things in future. There will be race to bottom. People will try to implement the standard as cheaply and simply as they can. And they will be good at that. They will be good. Environment will change. So what is now industrial environment, it's not the same as today. It wasn't the same as yesterday either. And there are huge differences between evaluators. I'm already hearing that how on earth these guys did get this evaluated. Well, it was evaluator. Evaluators take so much different stand. And problem is that the standard doesn't say how good you have to do things. So will standard evolve? What do you think? Will there be revisions of standard to match the changing things? I don't think so. So we will see more and more different interpretations and certification teams will start to interpret things differently. This doesn't make standard failed, but it makes it that you have to pay who was certifying the stuff. If it was somebody known to make very strict certifications, then it's probably high security. If it was somebody from somewhere you don't know about, then it might not be as good. It might be not good at all. Typical discussion inside company goes this way when starting this kind of work. Customers want to have secure devices. They really want to have. Okay, let's make so secure devices that we can make it competitive advantage. I have heard these words several times. Yeah, good idea. But actually, customers want to have certified devices. They don't know what is secure device. They can't measure it, they can't taste it. They just don't know what is secure device. I actually made a test with uh, Dalle. I asked it to draw secure, devi uh, in secure devices. It made a lock on top of the devices or something like that. Okay, good. I asked it to draw insecure device. 
well, it same, gave the same as with, with devices only. So Dalle thinks that every device is insecure device. Well, might be, can't make difference. Unfortunately, pictures were so boring that I didn't take them here. This is the fight between compliance and security. You need both of them. You need to have compliance to make customers happy, and you need to have security to make customers happy after five years. Once they, because compliance doesn't really protect you against hackers, but security does. But customers can't buy security, they can only buy compliance. So vendors should really do both of them. But they are a little bit different things. Compliance is about measurable things, easy to measure things typically. Valuable things are, for example, these, feed, these secret features, resourcing, documentation. Then, whether the process actually work, works exactly it, as it should, maybe not that important. It's nice to have, but not always so important. Whereas, getting things do, to be secure, you need motivation. People must be motivated. Without that, they will fake it, because it's so much easier. Also, they must get feedback. And in general, they, they are quite different things. And you need to think which one is driving company. Many process-oriented companies are really driven by compliance, and then they do the compliance, and then they wonder why the security wasn't that good after all. When you have certified your device, is it secure? Does your emperor have the clothes? You actually cannot really yet know. The things that um, ne really need to pay that attention still is the feedback. Do you get, is your feedback loop working? Is it only incidents that are feedback? Or do you get testing creative enough and hacker? And also motivating the team in other ways. Do the, are they willing to tell the problems they know? Most of the teams know problems. Are they talking about those? And I have heard some disobey conference that talks about this kind of things. Have you heard it, about it? Maybe, maybe. Because even if you are an individual work developer inside this kind of making these kind of IoT devices or, 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 or industrial devices, you still can apply these nice things. You really still can apply. Go on, look at what your product does do and tell about it within company. And share information. And don't be asshole, because that, that will kill your effort. But I have heard from one manager of uh, industrial device manufacturer that why on earth we can't have more this kind of hacker people? They would love to have more of them, but their culture is killing it. So maybe we should have this kind of hacker inside sticker after all, that corporate would tell that we have these hackers inside the company. Maybe, I don't know. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions?